Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon and welcome to South Africa at the Hagia on Hilal TV channel 347. We are coming to you live from our studios in Ravonia, Johannesburg. So you've just heard it, of course, from uh, the uh, panel at the International Court of Justice. Let me just uh, refresh what was said, of course. It was said that Israel must halt its current uh, brutal military offensive that is happening in uh, Gaza and, of course, especially in the Rafa area where its ground invasion is taking full effect. Uh, the ICJ also ruled that Israel must allow investigators to investigate genocide. So yes, they must allow investigations through any internationally recognized body to go ahead and do investigations. It also uh, ruled that Israel must open all eight corridors to allow for humanitarian aid, something which has been a massive challenge for the people of Rafa, Khan Yunus, and so many other parts of Gaza. And Israel needs to submit documents starting from today. So on the 24th of June, they'll need to submit documents that they've adhered to uh, the rulings that were made back in January the 26th. Uh, they are binding and they must be adhered to. And of course, the ruling was quite unanimous. 13 votes uh, to two. And of course, uh, Sebotinde, the judge that, uh, of course, ruled against South Africa, uh, in back in January, again, going against uh, some of the rulings that were major. So I'm not alone in the discussion. I'd like to welcome uh, two academics into the discussion. They're going to be going ahead and breaking down the legal perspective and, of course, the political perspective. Let me welcome Otilia Monganitze. She is the head of special Pro projects at the Institute of Security Studies and an international lawyer. And I'd also like to welcome a familiar face here at uh, Hilal TV, Jo Blun, she's from the London School of Economics, and she's also part of the South African Jews for a Free Palestine. I want to start with you, Otilia. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us here on Hilal TV. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Otilia, your first initial reaction to what was read out? Um, I'll be honest. Mm. I was typing and mm. capturing what was being discussed, mm -hmm. but I was mm. also on the verge of tears. Mm. Um, as a, a, a person who uh, works on international criminal justice and has seen institutions not always respond to the very needs of the people on the ground, to hear that a majority of the judges, 13 to 2, um, voted not only to uh, end the military offensive in Rafa, mm. but also added that it is necessary to ensure that investigators, including those from commissions of inquiry mm. can be able to access the territory of the occupied Palestinian uh, uh, territories and be able to actually properly investigate mm. what is currently ongoing. We see it on our TVs, mm. but when it comes to a criminal prosecution, it will be that evidence that will be integral in ensuring uh, conviction. And then, of course, maintaining that channels for humanitarian aid are critical. We know this. We know that the millions of people in the occupied Palestinian territories at the moment are surviving on humanitarian aid. Mm -hmm. So when humanitarian aid access is restricted, that access means millions become in worse conditions than before. More people are dying right now of famine before the bullets even land in their areas. And so having those reaffirmations from the International Court of Justice, for me, um, I won't lie, mm. it was extremely emotional, mm. even as I was busy trying to capture yes. all of that information. Yeah, I, I, I could share the same feeling with regards to you in that case, Otilia. Joe, I want to bring you in. Oh, this is not a good week for Benjamin Netanyahu and his cabinet, is it? Um, no, I mean, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, with this, mm. both, uh, both this quite assertive uh, comment on the need to immediately halt mm. uh, the military offensive in, in Rafa, uh, and also to allow in humanitarian aid and uh, investigators, um, and the the kind of quite quite significant. Although mm. the ICC didn't use the term genocide specifically, mm. um, the application for arrests uh, for Netanyahu, mm. um, uh, you know, in in from the ICC, and I think I will share. I, I believe Otilia and I were at the Assembly of States Parties mm. to the Statute in New York. 
uh, when Palestine was first uh, there as a a state. Mm. Um, I, and I think I remember. I think I think I remember the two of us sort of saying, you know, this is such, this is such a profound and important moment. Mm. But will you know will we ever see? Uh, white Western actors in the mm. dock uh, at the ICC. Um, and so I still remain skeptical, but I do think um, the ICJ uh, being emphatic in a context where we have uh, blatant fascist genocide mm. denialism uh, to kind of reinforce uh, the prima facie case for uh, for this uh, ongoing case, to call for an immediate um cessation of of a military onslaught um i think really uh you know signals uh, you know what happens next is is it remains to be seen but really really signals not only to netanyahu but to the zionist entity writ large and its global supporters uh that at the legal level uh impunity is uh, is not something that is going to be accepted otilia um the word genocide, of course, and it has been used to describe this from many of the, uh, you know, the lobby groups here in South Africa, outside of the country also. From your understanding, maybe to just, you know, to describe it to a layman, what are the legal terms when describing genocide? So, for example, um, one would say that the cutting off of aid could be potentially considered that. Uh, the fact that there is no warnings when uh, military uh, 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 offensives are happening and bombs are being dropped without prior warning. So when we take the context of what is happening in uh, Gaza at the moment, how does it constitute genocide when those investigators are going to go there? What are they going to be looking at to officially make this a clear-cut case of genocide? Right. So genocide is uh, defined mm. as a, a crime of mm. specific intent. Mm. It goes beyond just uh, saying, for example, people are being targeted. It is about targeting people on the basis of uh, various identities, including national and ethnic identity. The ICJ, in accepting this case already, has indicated, and they repeated it today, that there is a prima facie reason for which we must protect the uh, Palestinian peoples. Mm. And so what constitutes genocide? Genocide is not just about uh, killing particular members of a group. Genocide includes moving or relocating parts of the group to another community. For example, moving children of uh, Palestinian descent out of their families into other areas and into other homes. It includes rape as a tool of genocide, something that came about as a result of a South African judge at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda arguing that there are certain forms of extreme mm -hmm. violence that amount to genocide. Genocide also includes depriving people of the means of survival. That means shutting down water, for example, limiting access for humanitarian aid workers. These all mm. fall within the definition of genocide. Mm. What then needs to be met? A few things. One, that people of a particular group are being targeted. Two, that they are being mm. targeted because of their identity. Mm. And three, that the conditions, whether through murder, whether through restrictions of services and, and access, are designed to exterminate that group in whole or in part. Mm. What I must stress is that genocide is not a number counting game. Yes. So it doesn't mm. mean that there has to be a certain number of mm. people that have died as a mm. result of those actions for it to amount to genocide. Mm. The numbers can be small. They can be hundreds of thousands. Mm. Just yesterday, the UN General Assembly voted that the 11th of July would be recognized as the day of memory for those that were killed in Srebrenica yes. in 1995. Mm. There, just under 9,000 people were killed over a period of a mm. few weeks simply because of their ethnic identity. 
But even if it's two people, if you're able to show that those people were targeted expressly because of their ethnic identity, because of their nationality, mm -hmm. that those people were targeted for that, and the intention was to ensure that the group mm -hmm. that they're from could be, not now, even in the future, exterminated in whole or in part, that amounts to mm -hmm. genocide. Joe, there, there's something that Otelia picked up or uh, mentioned right over there, and I want to bring you into this because I know you've been studying this quite well, from the settler violence that has been happening in the West Bank to gatherings of right-wing Zionist extremists who, and, and you've seen uh, Ben Gir and Smotrich attending these very same conferences where they are calling, and it's specific, and, and you could see. And this wasn't mentioned on social media. This was even mentioned in the mainstream media, where they are calling for the total annihilation of the Arab population in Gaza so that they can clear it for more Zionist expansion to happen. Now, that in itself should give more evidence that these words that are being mentioned could tantamount to genocide. Uh, yeah, Farah, thanks for, for bringing that up. I think um, sort of thinking with, or I think, you know, I think there's genocide, the, the crime, uh, and then there's genocide, the structure. Um, and I think what we are dealing with uh, in Palestine uh, is what has been since the establishment of the state in 1948, uh, and an apartheid genocidal structure, mm. right, built on the back of the ongoing Nakba. Mm. Um, so I think that's I think that's a really important thing to recognize, to situate this uh, within a context that's often kind of absented uh, from the legal conversation, which is that uh, genocide itself, uh, you know, the, 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 the existence of colonial genocide, such mm. as what we are witnessing in Palestine being live streamed, um, has long preceded uh, the existence of the Genocide Convention, has long preceded the existence of the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. Um, so what we're seeing is the perpetuation of an ongoing structure that, I mean, I remember a conversation we have had that goes back to the Balfour mm -hmm. Declaration, uh, the colonization of, of Mandate Palestine, the apartheid occupation, the displacement, the ethnic cleansing. Um, and all of this is part of a genocidal contract um, that in very many ways governs uh, what we would call a Western international community. I mean, in the same way that Australia, the United States, Canada, uh, you know, South Africa, Zimbabwe have been settler colonial states. Um, what we see there is, is this kind of continuation of this logic. And, and I think you're absolutely right, you know, when we look at uh, the language, and I think mm. that's a very key yes. part of how we remember that uh, Raphael Lemkin, uh, the progenitor of the term mm. genocide, um, was himself a linguist mm. uh, with a legal interest, and he was interested in language. Mm. Uh, and so language is very important. So when we say see things uh, like human animals um, being used as an expression, when we see the invocation of, of a, a, a Zionist appropriation mm. of Jewish faith, in the shape of the Amalek uh, myth uh, as grounds for this, we are seeing a call for the total extermination. Um, and, and, and I think you can't think of this without, on the one hand, you know, you're seeing flags being put up, you're seeing uh, libraries being burned, you're seeing places being raised. And, and, and I, can't, I don't think you can also abstract this in terms of thinking of global imperialism and global capitalism. Mm. Um, from the fact that there are oil and gas reserves mm. uh, offshore Gaza and how that is also one of the significant economic drivers of this. So I think it's 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 a colonial imperial pact um, that is genocidal in structure and, mm. and also, as, as Otilia mentions, deeply gendered, you know, in, in particularly orientalist Islamophobic ways. Mm. Uh, that are that are so deeply violent. So I think, yeah, in Gaza and in the West Bank, um, we need to understand this as as a total genocidal annihilatory structure mm. um, that demands, you know, an absolute isolation of of the Zionist state in the same way um, that we saw eventually happening with South Africa. Yeah. 
Otelia, eyewitness uh, accounts are going to be very important. And I think it's, we saw it with the TRC and of course uh, here in South Africa and many people have their doubts with regards to, you know, whether the TRC really presented true justice for the uh, for over 400 years of colonialism and apartheid that South Africa had gone through. But we see the, uh, the first-hand accounts live on our television sets on social media of babies being pulled out of the rubble, uh, mothers seeing the death of their own children, fathers seeing the death of their own children, old people, some people who experienced the Nakba back in 1948 going through something similar. How much will the uh, investigators who are going to visit areas in Gaza and Rafa going to take this first-hand account, you know, God willing, if the people are still safe, to give those accounts? How much of those evidence is really going to be telling and defining in the final investigations for these uh, independent investigators? So uh, taking a really mm. big step back, mm which is um, in terms, and I'm focusing here on the international criminal court process, mm. but I also want to stress something, which is the international criminal court process is one element mm. of the many forms of accountability that should be there. Mm. There should also be efforts at domestic level to be able to ensure accountability. And when I say domestic mm. level, I mean countries like South Africa, for example, who in the past have been approached to issue arrest warrants for people like the former foreign minister, Tsipi Livni, mm. as far back as 2011 for Operation Cost Lead. Mm. Um, and I say this because what Joe said is important. While the International Criminal Court at the moment is seeking arrest warrants only for events since October of 2023, the context in the occupied Palestinian territories is not an eight-month context. Mm -hmm. It is a 76-year-old context in which accountability can be gotten across the board. And I think that is part of what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. So what kind of evidence will be useful? In uh, issuing or in requesting uh, that the ICC issue arrest warrants, the prosecutor relied on a lot of evidence already gotten through uh, the internet, through um, uh, eyewitness evidence that has been shared. And the call for people to submit evidence uh, in the, in the uh, digital evidence that is in the situation in Palestine actually precedes October 2023. Mm -hmm. It is from May of 2023, mm -hmm. where the ICC opened a portal allowing people like yourself, uh, like me, as well as people on the ground to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But that is one part of the evidence that is required. And that is why granting access to investigators, to commissions of inquiry is also important. Because what we are witnessing, what you and I can see from thousands of kilometers away is in my mind a fraction of what is happening on the ground. It is important to be able to identify the specific locations with geolocation data has been able to do and as part of the ICC building its case, it is important to be able to identify perpetrators. I will say anecdotally, late last year, when people were lamenting a number of South Africans who had chosen to take up arms on behalf of the Israeli state, my comment was screenshot, record, capture all of that information because even in South Africa, through the regulation of foreign military assistance, through the regulation of uh, recruitment into, into, um, into mercenary groups, South Africa can also prosecute beyond the other range of crimes, mm -hmm. individuals who are South African citizens or who are South African permanent residents for taking up arms on behalf of the state of Israel. So it is to say, give as much information as possible, use complementary information that allows the case to be built. Parts will be enough, maybe, but we don't know that. Mm. We cannot gamble on bits and pieces being sufficient. So as much information as is possible has to be shared and provided. And, and I cannot stress this enough, the ICJ 
ordering access for investigators, not only, and I have to stress this, the ICJ did not only order access for um, criminal investigators, they also in their listing included a range of other individuals that would be uh, part of investigative panels. For example, the UN in, uh, Independent Investigative Panel that is headed by former Judge Navi Pillay mm -hmm. has been uh, blocked from accessing um, the occupied Palestinian territories. With this order, it is saying such blockades of access are illegal and they should be allowed to gather as much information as they can. And it will be that information that will come in handy, not only for the ICC, mm -hmm. but for any state that would want to proceed with, with a process against um, the many, and I have to stress this, the many people. Two indictments on the Israeli side for me is too little, mm. but it's more than none. Yeah, and you've just brought up so many topics that we're going to be discussing in a, in a short while, Otelia, with regards to the blocking and, of course, the intertwining of the ICC uh, decision earlier this week and the ICJ decision today. Uh, Joe, uh, just two weeks ago, you and I attended the South African uh, Global Anti-Apartheid Conference, and we heard many eyewitness uh, accounts from many people, either from the West Bank or from Rafa or Gaza, that, of course, were able to escape. And you know, I must stress that I know of a, of a, of a 16-year-old girl that experienced what she was born into the 2008 uh, a war that happened in Gaza, and she's now 16, and she's now a refugee that is, of course, right now in Khan Yunus, and we communicate on a number of times, and she tells me about what is currently happening on the ground. There's an eyewitness account right over there, but you and I listen to eyewitness accounts, Joe. Uh, these eyewitness accounts from Palestinians who are either now part of the diaspora in South Africa or are just visiting and, are, and are occupying other places within the world, their accounts are going to be important, isn't it? And these accounts are authentic because it's lived experience. And they, it needs to be understood, isn't it, Joe, that this is important for the world to understand because education right now is the key for the globe to understand just how much of pain the people of Palestine are going through right now. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, so I think it's, it's a profoundly important point, both in terms of the... Uh, the instrumental, you know, Im importance of it in terms of investigations, and uh, but uh, we are living through a Holocaust, a genocide, and and bearing witness is, I think, uh, one of the things that it means to do to to be human, uh, and doing so politically, and uh, you know, is is also is also deeply deeply important. Um, I think, I think two things on this, uh, sorry, I'm just sort of gathering. No, sure, take your um, time. Joe, are you still there with us? Okay, we seem to have lost, uh, yeah, we seem to have lost Joe Blown, or we're gonna try and get her back. Uh, Otelio, I will try to connect with uh, Joe. I wanna bring up the, the intertwining of the ICC and the ICJ, because this has happened in a matter of 72 uh, hours. Uh, for, for the layman out there that maybe uh, tries to understand whether this is combined with each other, there's, if there is an intertwining, can you maybe discuss just the importance of this, these two decisions within a matter of 72 hours for the testing and the confidence within international law. I ask this because there's many out there that are not confident within international law, especially when you see Israel completely violating so many UN resolutions. The fact that there was a ceasefire and an overwhelming decision on a ceasefire, which was called in March. So how important are these decisions 72 hours from each other? Uh, thank you. I see that Joe is back. I okay. don't know if you would want me okay. to respond. Uh, Joe, are can... you are you back? I am back. Yes, but please I do. am happy for... Okay. Yeah, please uh, do continue. Okay, thank mm. you. So I just sorry, mm. I uh, I don't know what happened with my internet. Sure, there. no problem. Uh, 
and my emotions. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think that I, I saw a comment. Uh, I believe it was from Christiane Almanpour, uh, which which quite disappointed me, I must say, um, because you know she obviously covered Sarajevo and Bosnia in in such a profoundly powerful way on on genocide. But one of the comments that she said is that. You know, we don't know what's going on because no Western journalists have been able to get in. Um, and I think that's deeply, deeply problematic. Uh, and I think that, you know, what we have seen, and I think this is is something, and I think Atulia's point about, mm. about archiving also, because we don't know what happens, you know, many of our kind of social media sites are are also owned mm. by by deeply dangerous Zionist uh, people, uh, it, you know. So I think we're keeping an archive of, of those uh, testimonies from citizen journalists, uh, from people on the ground is so, so very important. Um, and I think, and, and just to kind of put this in a bit of historical perspective, um, you know, if you go back to the, the Nuremberg trials, mm -hmm. I've been reading the Einsatzgruppen trial at the moment, uh, which was what was called the Holocaust by bullets. Um, you know, it was with the Einsatzgruppen death squads uh, that went through Eastern Europe. Uh, in fact, from where my uh, my grandmothers came from, um, and um, and when you read that, you know, one of the things that was very interesting is that the the chief prosecutor there refused to take uh, testimony from from uh, from survivors. Mm. Uh, because he said, you know, they change their story, they do this, they do that. Uh, and he was more interested in a historical record that was kind of archival. Um, and I think where we're at, and I think it's very important to learn the mistakes of Nuremberg, mm. uh, is that that we are in a place where that testimony means so much more than anything else could. Mm. Uh, and to take that seriously and to to honor uh, resistance in its many ways, uh, survivorship in its many ways, uh, life and, and death in its many ways. Um, and to take seriously that kind of responsibility to bear witness and to think about what that kind of brings for, for all, both in the legal space, but, but in terms of our kind of, you know, collective humanity, uh, you, you know, I don't, I don't even know what mm. to say there, but yeah, I think uh, deeply, deeply important. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Otilia, the question I asked you earlier on. Um, great, thank you. Um, maybe just uh, uh, adding before I do uh, sure. a couple of notes, um, which is um, while for me, I, I appreciate the need to get some of the uh, firsthand uh, accounts I'm also very sensitive to the trauma mm. that that can have on people being grilled on what happened to them, what happened to their families. And that is why I stress the importance of those of us who, let, let me be frank, have the luxury of distance. Mm. Those of us who have the luxury of distance to be the ones who also take on that task of collecting as much information and being able to, to share it as possible so that the survivors of the violence don't have to memorize what happened. They don't have to repeat it uh, 20, 30 times before someone believes them. To your question to me around this, uh, this moment in, in time, so to speak, I'm going to broaden it a little bit, if you don't mind, sure. because I think um, the, the question is around faith and international justice institutions, and it focuses on two particular cases. But I'm going to take us back 20 years, and I'm going to take us back to the first request for an advisory opinion into the occupation of the West Bank, which was the war opinion at the time. And I'm taking us back those 20 years because that ICJ process laid the seeds in many ways to the current ICJ process on an advisory opinion on occupation and settlement that goes beyond just the West Bank as an occupied territory of Palestine. And that connects with what Joe was saying earlier, which is you can uh, focus on bits and pieces of what we are seeing, but ultimately when you take a step back 
and you see that the crimes that I, I talk about, for example, are happening in a context where it is conducive for those kinds of crimes to occur, and there's little that is being done otherwise. And then you take South Africa, a country so far geographically removed from Palestine, but so close to Palestine, 1948, is a year that is significant for both Palestine and South Africa in the way in which we understand the crime of apartheid, in the way in which we understand the ways in which racist systems of oppressions can have a lasting impact, even when they're supposedly gone. Mm -hmm. So here you have South Africa bringing this case forward and pushing, by the way, because South Africa got provisional uh, measures ordered in January of this year. And South Africa said, that's not enough. They went back in February. They went back in March. They went back last week to say, the situation is changing. If we are seeing it, and this is what we are saying, you as the court must also see it. This happens at the same time as an international criminal court process happens. What I want to stress about the ICC prosecutors a request for arrest warrants is that uh, a number of uh, international law experts were brought together to be able to uh, also advise the office of the prosecutor. So yes, you see one man with two people standing be behind him uh, uh, on this request for arrest warrants, but beyond the eight experts that put together the report, there are dozens, hundreds of people doing the hard work of researching and ensuring that all the T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted, that the kind of accountability that needs to happen does. It is an important moment. And I think, yes, it can have people uh, starting to believe in international justice again, but we also have to be frank. International justice exists in a space of a global political context mm. in which that inequality is there. What happened immediately after the issuing uh, of that request for arrest warrants? You saw two categories of statements. You saw those supporting the decision, and then you saw those saying, unacceptable. How can Hamas be named in, a, in, in the same statement as Israeli leaders? You saw uh, threats, uh, for example, for US Congress to sit and discuss possibly sanctioning the International Criminal Court. But there's something else that happened in this week, which is monumental for how we understand the international system. Countries like Norway, a very rich Western nation that really doesn't have to hold any particular positions if it doesn't want to, coming forward, the prime minister and the foreign minister announcing two days ago, Norway's recognition of Palestine's statehood in full. Spain, Ireland also doing likewise. Over the course of the next few weeks, we are going to see more countries coming forward. That for me is what starts to build trust in the global system in any way or form. And let me be frank, the global system will disappoint us at different points because structures geared supposedly to cater for 8 billion people will always end up being more beneficial to a, a few. But where you see countries coming forward and strongly so in situations where before they may have been silent, that is where the confidence comes from. It is confidence in the global legal system and international institutions, but it is also confidence in the various other structures. What does this say of the ones that are disappointing us, like the UN Security Council? like individual states that could do more but choose not to. It says, actually, in 2024, we see you, mm. right? Before, they could hold whatever positions they had and we wouldn't know about it. But now, the lens, similar to gathering evidence for crimes, is on them in the same way. And we're seeing people in those communities also rising up through different forms of protest, peaceful protests across university campuses, stressing the need for the recognition of the state of Palestine, but also of um, what is currently ongoing and the support 
financial and otherwise that is being given to continue the the the, the perpetuation of uh, uh, international crimes in in Palestine, and I think those put together. Mm. Sorry, I took a little bit longer. No, please responding. do. We we did. did. But Please all of ahead. those things mm. put together mm. help us to see what can be done. And I'll end with uh, one thing that for me stuck out a few months ago. When countries were presenting their oral arguments at the ICJ mm. uh, in respect of the occupation case, there were many countries, big countries, mm. small countries, so to speak, uh, arguing the AU, the Organization for Islamic Cooperation mm. also. One country for me stood out and that one country's arguments for me are, are arguments that I wish people would also look at. Mm. It was the small island nation of the Maldives. Mm. The Maldives came forward at the ICJ and said, we support the arguments that have been made by Palestine, by South Africa, by Norway, by Ireland. What we want to focus on is the fact that people in Palestine are being deprived of water, of the environment, of their own space, mm. that olive trees are being burned. That is part, an integral part of their identity. So the Maldives focused on water, mm. the environment, mm. and the land, mm. something that bigger countries put as footnotes but didn't emphasize. Yes. And for the Maldives, a small uh, island nation, it was important to say when we talk about occupation, mm -hmm. we need to recognize when individuals are deprived even of the most basic things like clean drinking water because the occupying force is blocking it. Mm -hmm. They are blocking that country's ability to have full self-determination. Adila, you've just hit the nail on the head with regards to taking away cultural heritage and the, la and, and the fact that they've cut off a basic human right, a global human right, something as important as water. Joe, I want to bring you in, and that there's something interesting and, and something uh, important that Otilia mentioned. Global change, global perception, the changing of that perception. And this week has been quite a whirlwind with regards to this. And if you could uh, just... Bear with me because I'm going to take some time to try and explain this, Joe. We saw, of course, for the last few weeks, universities in the United States of America, Ivy League universities in the United States of America. Just yesterday, Harvard University had a walkout in solidarity with Gaza. And this has continued. You send it in South Africa, of course, UCT and VITS, which are considered the quote-unquote Ivy Leagues of South African universities holding encampments. You've seen from the entertainment industry, Macklemore, Grammy award-winning artist, standing up for Palestine. But the two that stood out for me was award-winning actress, Kate Blanchett, wearing a dress signifying solidarity with Palestine. And then a member of Senate, someone from the Democratic Party, Lily Greenberg Call, resigning, saying that she cannot stand what Joe Biden is doing in aiding Israel. If that's not a change in perception, then what is uh, uh, a joke? Uh, yeah, Faraz, that's, you know, absolutely. I think we have seen, uh, I would argue, you know, quite late uh, in the game, but very important, no less. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a shift, and I, I mean, to come back to the question of, of the recognition, state recognition, uh, let's bear in mind that most, you know, states in the, in the state system have recognized Palestine for a very long time. Uh, in the global south, across Africa, uh, this has been a, a very long, I think I think it's important that we're seeing this in the West, um, but I do want to kind of emphasize that that support for for Palestine, for Palestinian resistance, for um, for and 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 specifically, I think when I'm so you know Artelia's point about the land is key here. And speaking from South Africa, mm. where I think it was, I, I might be wrong on this, but I think the ICJ uh, was established in 1913, uh, which is in year as the. Yes. Uh, the Land, the Land Act, Act. Uh, the Native Land Act mm -hmm. was was here, and I think you know reading these together, these are, these exist in circuits, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we still live in a in a country in South Africa where uh, land dispossession um, remains kind of an overarching structure 
um, of this country. Uh, when Otilia brings in 1948, we're talking about two, not only simultaneous establishment of apartheid states, but deeply connected uh, apartheid states. Um, so I think absolutely just as we saw a kind of a, a tide of change uh, that came Eventually, I mean, I've, Margaret Thatcher, you know, still stubbornly refusing to impose sanctions in the in the eighties. Um, you know, I think this is deeply important, and I think there's been some some remarkable moments of solidarity. I think uh, what the students have done, uh, you know, also following a kind of long history of of I'm talking in South Africa here, but also globally, you know, a long history of occupations um, at university campuses against apartheid, uh, you know, that that uh, universities, uh, you know, which continue, you know, we saw footage of someone burning a university, an Israeli soldier burning a university library and taking a selfie of himself yesterday. And our universities are still uh, refusing to boycott Israeli universities. I mean, it's it's just uh, it's absurd. The PACB uh, agreement, the boycott, uh, the boycott arrangement has been in place for a very long time. So yes, I think we're seeing change. I think we need to see. I think this is the time uh, where we need to understand the materialities of this struggle as well, um, and that uh, the economic viability of maintaining a Zionist entity needs to be put to bed. Um, so an absolute isolation, whether it's diplomatic, uh, the absolute entrenchment of the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign, full sanctions, trade sanctions, uh, just kind of thinking connectedly. Uh, Israel being one of the biggest exporters of, of diamonds uh, when it has no di diamonds, but in fact loots uh, with impunity in the DRC, fueling the genocide there. Um, our struggles are connected. And the Zionist entity is, is deeply connected. And I think just to kind of bring it back into the question of genocide here, the Genocide Convention is very clear on complicity. Um, and so the complicity of those who continue to arm and fund the Israeli state uh, is not, you know, is not something that can that that they can get away with. Um, so yes, I think the tide is turning, and I think uh the pressure. Uh, and, and as it does, of course, there are increasing fascist crackdowns uh, on protesters. Um, you know, I, even uh, you're reading about Germany and the, mm. the arrest of, 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 I mean, pre predominantly Arab, Muslim and mm. uh, Black and Palestinian uh, protesters, but also anti-Zionist Jews being arrested by uh, Christian Germans. Um, there is something in, in my personal bones yes. that that does it particularly well mm. for. Well, it takes you back uh, to the but, 1930s. Right before but, World yeah, War II, yes. I mean, it's also mm. for, for saying the word mm. genocide. Mm. Um, so that is what we are dealing with, which is why I think this is important, that we are maintaining uh, this line. And I do think this is changing. Um, I think that the... the so we, we're moving forward on the legal side. I think the, the political movement in support of a free Palestine from the river to the sea has been in place mm. for a very long time and, and is only emboldening and is only becoming more powerful and people are becoming braver and, and it is very powerful. Um, I think alongside the recognition of Palestine, and that must be the recognition of Palestine on the terms set by Palestinians, you know, and also, uh, you know, this kind of meandering around certain kind of two-state diplomatic, you know, I, I don't, I think that that is, that is something that is, that is important to be set by Palestinians and not to be imposed by others. Um, is very important. And 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 this cannot be divorced from the issue of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And this cannot be divorced. We saw uh, you, this cannot be divorced from the need to absolutely end uh, and for and for the South African government as well to put in a sanctions uh, arrangement to to um, absolutely cease trade. Uh, there are so many other ways to to imagine our economy in more equitable ways that do not keep dispossessing black and working class people uh, in this country um, and globally. And so I think that imagination is in order and that that our struggles are connected here. So yes, I agree with you, the tide is turning and it is important, but there are still people as we speak being bombarded yes. in Rafa mm. um, and that we need an absolute economic strangulation uh, of the state of Israel if there's to be uh, an Israel.
there's to be any uh, kind of, you know, to, to give heft and weight uh, to the deeply important uh, protest uh, movements and support for Palestine that we have seen. The next question for both uh, you, Otilia, and Joe, and I'm going to start with you, Otilia, is the question of impunity. Um, immediately after the ICC, of course, um, you know, issued uh, the, you know, the looking into the arrest warrants to Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, you have Gallant, there was a criticism of the ICC uh, with regards to it being labeled, quote unquote, anti Semitic. Uh, they have no right to issue an arrest warrant. Then you get President Joe Biden of the United States of America saying that uh, the ICC has no legal grounds or nothing at all to go ahead and issue these arrest warrants to uh, Netanyahu and Callan. Um, Otilia and, and many people said that, there we go, nothing's going to happen. The ICC is not going to issue these arrest warrants because the big, the big, the big boss of the world, the United States of America, has given its full support for Israel. Um, as a global community, from a legal perspective, is there a concern that there could be a potential withdrawal from Karim Khan and the rest of the ICC? Right. Um, so first, mm. uh, the, the challenge with uh, impunity mm. is, is, is how we end up where we are mm. now, right? Where for decades um, you have effectively been allowed to get away quite literally with murder, the idea of any form of accountability starts to feel like oppression. Um, how dare you challenge uh, my actions in this way? The U.S. is not a state party to the Rome Statute, and the U.S. infamously years ago is the only country that has ever uh, blocked the ICC prosecutor and the head of the Justice Complementarity uh, Division from entering the U.S., has that stopped the International Criminal Court from being able to do the, the bits of work that it can do? No. But I want to uh, go back to what I said earlier, which is if we put all of our accountability eggs into the ICC mm. basket, we can set ourselves up for disappointment. That's not to say that the ICC will not proceed. The ICC receives no U.S. funding, for example. Mm. The U.S. cannot threaten to withdraw American funds from the court, for example. But the kind of accountability that is needed um, goes beyond just um, uh, Netanyahu and Gallen uh, indictments. They stretch to a lot of what Joe was just talking about now, which are the many different levers of pressure that need to be pushed. So... Will the uh, Office of the Prosecutor get the arrest warrants that they've requested? In my mind, yes. Mm. And part of why, and you asked the question earlier about the connection between the multiple cases, for the pretrial chamber of the International Criminal Court to, to say, well, we don't see uh, any crimes on the ground, when just today the International Court of Justice has not only reaffirmed that there is prima facie evidence of uh, potential genocide in the occupied Palestinian territories, but in their own words, that the situation is the most dire that they have ever seen, for the International Criminal Court to then come back and say, it's not that dire, is unlikely. So these multiple uh, uh, issues happening at the same time is important because if it were happening in a vacuum, then we could potentially say, you know what, it's unlikely that there would be a confirmation of the charges or that the arrest warrants would be issued. But I want to end on a note around hypocrisy. Mm. Barely 15, 14 months ago, when the arrest warrants for the current president of Russia, for mm. example, and his minister responsible for children affairs were issued. The same countries now talking about jurisdiction, talking about a sitting head of state being indicted, were the same ones that were saying, this is great, finally a form of accountability. Now, I will say, as a person who believes that even, regardless of who the indictee is, mm -hmm. let there be a presumption of innocence, regardless of what I may think of their guilt. When a person, when an arrest warrant is issued, it is not for me to say, no, you can't, you can't go after uh, this particular person when I see the context playing out on the ground. 
So for me, whether it's Putin, whether it's Netanyahu, whether it's al-Bashir, whether it's Muammar al-Gaddafi before, yeah. the indictment of those individuals, if indeed the situation on the ground reflects that the military is acting on command responsibility, for me, it doesn't matter where they are from, who they are, that accountability must be happen. Mm -hmm. And it is that kind of messaging that we are seeing from statements from South Africa, statements from Slovenia, from Belgium, from Norway, reaffirming the jurisdiction of the court. It will be those members of the International Criminal Court, not the countries that haven't signed up to it. Those will be the ones that have to stand the, the, the guard, so to speak, to ensure that there is no uh, impunity and that there is no political interference. I will end by saying, for the first time, the Office of the Prosecutor in their statement indicated that they would not hesitate to uh, invoke Article 71 of the uh, uh, Rome Statute, which speaks to the level of intimidation, mm. harassment that they have faced. Mm. Before, it's not that they haven't received threats before, mm. but they have never risen to the level where the prosecutor says, I will invoke this because the amount of intimidation that they have faced personally and as part of an institution are at a level that does need to be addressed. And what that will look like, because it will be the first time that this happens, what that will look like will be new for all of us. Joe, uh, we've, we've got a few minutes left, and there's just another question I need to ask both of you. But Joe, in a matter of, um, uh, in just in three minutes, I don't know whether you've come across a spoiled brat child who takes, uh, who doesn't take no for an answer. It seems like Netanyahu and you have Gallant have become uh, those two spoiled childs where they've just said straight out, we don't care what the ICC or the ICJ say, we will continue what they're going to do. And they've been backed up by their big daddy that is, of course, none other than the United States of America. But there's a red, fla there's a red line to this, isn't there? Surely this impunity can't continue for long. Uh, yeah, big genocidal children, uh, big fascist children. Um, I so I th I mean I think this is a really important question. Let me try and do this in three minutes. Um, number one, you know, at the entrance of the ICC, there's a in the, in the atrium, there's a sign which is a, a quote, um, and it says, "This cause is the cause of all humanity." Uh, and it refers not actually to the ICC, but to the norm of anti-impunity. Uh, if you look back to its original context, which was a 2003 speech by then UN Secretary General. Um, so the idea of anti-impunity is, is kind of the key idea underpinning uh, the whole project of international criminal law. As I understand it, um, for most of the court's existence, uh, anti-impunity has sort of translated into uh, white immunity mm. or colonial immunity. Uh, and that's not all the fault of the court. That's a fault, in, of course, of the broader colonial geopolitical and legal architecture in which it exists. Um, but you do have that context. Now what you're seeing um, is, 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 you know, in, in effect, the, you know, these, uh, this genocide being, well, it, as they call it, war crimes but, uh, and crimes against humanity. But um, what what you know the ICJ is kind of opening to is genocide, um, being you know brought under investigation and um, the mud slinging. You know I think the um, the use again of of things like blood libel or anti semitism, which as I mean I've said this to you before, is such a deep deep offense uh, to our our own ancestors who passed in the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, there's such a conflation of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, which is violent and dangerous, Islamophobic, anti-Black and anti-Semitic uh, and sexist as well. Um, but I think this is, you know, this is very, very key. Um, I think the the question of impunity here, um, I think part of, part of what is being done and as part Joe? of a kind of theology uh, is is saying um you know that we can get away with it but i don't Joe, think they can anymore. Joe, I, unfortunately i have to stop you because otelia said that she has to leave soon so i just need to get this question into i, I apologize sincerely for stopping you there otelia in a minute because i know you need to go um just from a south african perspective and the moral high ground uh and, and somebody like yourself who has you know such a 
rich uh, 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 history of, 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 of legal understanding. You know, how, how, how important was this from a South African moral high ground perspective in one minute? Uh, look, we've uh, addressed parts of this already, mm. but this was extremely important. Mm. I spoke to the history, uh, what connects mm. uh, um, in many ways South Africa and, uh, and Palestine. But uh, many years ago, um, while uh, former President Nelson Mandela was still with us, one of the things, as South Africa being one of the first countries to recognize um, Palestine statehood, one of the things that he kept repeating was that we, our freedom is incomplete mm. without the freedom of the Palestinian people. Now, to then, so many years later, over three decades later, to then see the International Court of Justice do two things. One, reaffirm that there is a Palestinian identity and that that Palestinian identity is also tied to the physical land and nationality of Palestinian people is important. Two, that the responsibility to prevent genocide does not only rest on your immediate neighbor, that this applies to everyone across the board to be able to do that. For South Africa, I would say that is a, is, is a big win. I cannot stress enough when you look at the legal team that South Africa put together, but when you look at another thing, observing in the courtroom, I tuned in last week when South Africa and Israel were making their arguments, as I did uh, this afternoon. And on the South African side, you see a full courtroom and spill over seating. On the Israel side of the court, the numbers keep getting less and less. Mm -hmm. Now, if there is a win, if ever we can talk about wins in context as difficult as this, that alone, the optics alone, mm -hmm. speak to people choosing to align with what is effectively the right side of, these, of this situation. And right now, the right side of this situation is being spearheaded, not by South Africa, mm. but it is being spearheaded by the Palestinian people with the support of a global community that includes countries like South Africa. Matilia, thank you so much for joining us and for offering your wisdom. We really do appreciate it. Do enjoy the rest of your afternoon and weekend. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. That is uh, Otelia Monganitse, of course, head of special projects at the Institute of Security Studies and International Law. She had to excuse herself uh, to attend to other matters, but I need to get uh, Joe in because, Joe, we've got about three minutes, and I'm going to give this last three minutes to you. Um, there's something important that Otelia mentioned right over there, that it's being spearheaded by the Palestinians with the assistance of the legal team of South Africa. And as South Africans, both you and I, uh, we may come from different backgrounds, but we have the South African within us. And this is a proud moment, isn't it, that for the last um, five months, with, from a legal perspective, taking into the ICJ, South Africa stands tall in the world. Yeah, I think this is a really, really important mm. point. And I think the uh, what is happening at the ICJ, uh, what South Africa has done there, uh, in terms of going, and I think of this often, to The Hague, uh, which is the metropole uh, of the settler colony of South Africa, a metropole, uh, to take Israel, which funded the apartheid state, uh, to, uh, to the ICJ. I think you're absolutely right. This is a remarkable moment uh, in South Africa's foreign policy. Um, and I think at the same time, I think, and as, as I think both Otilia and I have said a few times, you know, to bring this back home as well and to think about this in the context of the many crises of austerity and, and racism and capitalism that still kind of underpin our society here. And how do we hold these together? And how do we imagine this as a moment where we can truly abolish apartheid everywhere in all its manifestations um, and to take this remarkable step in foreign policy and think about what it means domestically here, what it means for forms of apartheid genocidal logics that happen globally um, and how to kind of 
to take from this and to move from this in a way that truly sets the stage for reimagining uh, and to open up, uh, I think what, what the Palestinian resistance and what Palestinians have taught us is, you know, that you don't stop reimagining until, you know, this idea of sumud, until, and, you mm. know, we, we keep going until liberation. And I think a remarkably important step towards that. Joe, absolute pleasure having you on. It's always great to listen to your wisdom and, of course, offer your uh, words with regards to the ongoing struggle of the people of Palestine, but most importantly, the current the current ICJ case and, of course, that pending ICC case. Again, Joe, thank you so much and always a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much and greetings to your viewers. Thank you so much. Cheers. That is Joe Bloon from the London School of Economics and from the South African Jews for a free Palestine. That's all we have for you here on South Africa at The Hague. Uh, coming up next uh, is in a sheet competition from Cape Town, which our team from the Mother City will be bringing you live. For myself, Ross Patel, and the rest of the team in Johannesburg, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.